And the next topic is uh, coupled qubits. And we always discuss the si single qubit experiments, the concepts related to that. But of course, to build a quantum computer, you need coupled qubits. And uh, in this lecture, I will uh, uh, force on you again the qubits we already left, the, the spin qubits at the end of the lecture. So I'll give a, a quick refresher. Um, because the concepts uh, behind coupled qubits are very similar between different kinds of qubits. Uh, the only thing that's different uh, between these uh, different kinds of qubits is the type of coupling between the qubits. Um, and the, the types of coupling can be inductive, capacitive, um, and the more interesting uh, types of coupling that we will discuss today. I'm grateful to, once again, Andreas Walraff uh, for his slides, also to Hendrik Bloom for slides on uh, spin qubits. And I also use slides from Alexei Ustinov and Levin van der Seypen uh, uh, throughout this lecture. Let's go back for a brief second to the Di Vincenzo criteria and see how many of these criteria we kind of covered. Uh, we have covered the uh, qubit systems, right? I've shown you several different types of two-level systems that can work as qubits. Um, and we have covered uh, that you can always initialize these systems, uh, for example, by waiting for the relaxation time and then it drops to the ground state. That's a well-defined state. Um, and now, I focused a lot on these uh, single qubit gates, single qubit control, Rabi oscillations, Ramsey fringes, those kinds of effects provide you with a universal control over single qubits. Uh, but what about these? You also need these. You need these for a very important reason. Quantum computing works when multiple qubits, ideally thousands, are all entangled, quantum mechanically entangled. Then you get the quantum speed up, the parallelism that people talk about. Quantum computation becomes effective. And to entangle qubits, you need to do something on pairs of qubits. And so today we will study this part of the third Di Vincenzo criterion, universal set of quantum gates, but only related to coupling individual qubits. And of course, every qubit has its own readout. We uh, cover it every time. Now, the first um, class of qubits that we will discuss, just to continue the logic of the last two lectures, is superconducting qubits. And uh, just to give you a very quick summary, with superconducting qubits, people are able to do quite a bit uh, these days. Uh, very impressive experiments. Um, they can couple several qubits, not two, but actually up to maybe four. Here is a picture of, familiar to you perhaps, this meander that you can barely see. That's the microwave resonator. And the color boxes are four transmon qubits inside this resonator. Same has been done with uh, phase qubits, for example. Um, and people um, in these uh, resonators or otherwise coupled qubits um, stop thinking about sort of data points like uh, we are used to, curves with axes. Uh, showing a variable parameter like uh, power or time, Rabi oscillations, all of that is kind of uh, becoming purged from these papers. And uh, uh, papers on these multiple qubits often show the kind of block diagrams of the algorithms that they use to control these qubits. Uh, for example, this is a diagram for Grover's algorithm. We will come back to it this lecture. And then their data is uh, these kind of bars. These bars are density matrices. And the way they obtain them is by measuring um, thousands of times single shot events on these qubits, uh, and then plotting the statistics, correlations between different measurements. They obtain these kind of uh, measurements. So it, oftentimes, you, the entire paper will be picture of your device, the algorithm they apply, and these kind of bars. And that could be an extremely important paper. Uh, now, these blocks in this algorithm, um, these are horizontal lines are qubits. And uh, 
the boxes are operations on qubits. Uh, the single qubit boxes um, are typically pulses on single qubits, maybe to rotate the spin from up to down, that's a pi pulse. This is a pi over 2 pulse to create a superposition of up and down. These kind of pulses are single uh, qubit boxes. And a double qubit boxes, that's what we're going to discuss today, the coupling boxes. At the end, there's also always a readout. People also do algorithms on more than two qubits, three qubits. Now, the first type of coupling we will discuss is coupling between uh, two flux qubits. Um, conceptually, to me, it seems the simplest coupling. Remember flux qubits, they're loops of superconductor with some Josephson junctions to create the right potential. And uh, if you design these qubits right, you get a double well potential in a space of uh, flux versus energy. And the two wells correspond to flux pointing out of the board and into the board. And, uh, or you can say the qubit runs on superpositions of current circulating clockwise and counterclockwise in this loop. Now, already some years ago, a group at Berkeley have created a coupled flux qubit circuit. One qubit, a second qubit, and uh, they're coupled just by being close to each other. And what couples them is a magnetic field created by this flux goes in and penetrates this loop and therefore offsets the bias of this qubit. And vice versa, flux circulating in this loop goes and biases this qubit. That's inductive coupling. They're coupled by mutual inductance. The loop around these two qubits, that's the readout circuit. That's the squeeze that can detect uh, the, the various fluxes in the two loops. Look, uh, interestingly, they can uh, use the same squid, one readout, to read out both qubits because switching here and switching here produces distinguishable events inside the large squid. Um, and also, um, very interestingly, they found a nice trick where by uh, biasing this qubit, uh, sorry, biasing the, the readout, biasing the big squid, they can affect the amount of coupling between the two qubits. So remember, uh, these little crosses, they are Josephson junctions, and they have Josephson inductance, which is nonlinear. It depends on the bias with which you bias the junction. And so that means that depending on the external bias, the two qubits will have a slightly different inductance, so to say. So you can actually affect the mutual inductance between the two loops by changing the amount of uh, current you flow outside. So in this uh, circuit, especially the outer loop serves different purposes. The readout of the upper qubit, the readout of the lower qubit, the joint readout, uh, also a tunable coupler. So that was a very nice uh, experiment. What they have found is um, they have done spectroscopy on, the, on this system. They haven't gone too far in this experiment. They have done spectroscopy. Spectroscopy goes like this. Here is some flux bias, and uh, a qubit produces this parabola. Uh, those are the energy levels, transitions between the ground and the excited states of a qubit. Inductive uh, dispersion here. Um, and uh, the way they do this measurement is uh, by exciting with microwaves transitions between uh, uh, ground and excited states of each qubit. Um, and when the microwaves are on resonance with the level spacing, uh, they get the, the squid to flip because a flux in the qubit loop starts to go between uh, up and down, up and down. So there is some signal in the squid. That's how they get these uh, data points. Uh, the two qubits are somewhat offset. They're biased to slightly different points. Uh, but there is a position where they overlap. Um, and so this box should be here. At the overlap, the two levels can grow through each other, but they exhibit an anti-crossing. They don't cross they anti-cross. Means the two systems are coupled. That's right. Um, 
they're coupled by mutual inductance. Uh, that experiment actually beautifully demonstrates it because by changing the bias through the squid, they can affect the size of this anticrossing. You make it almost zero or ex increase it. So this is really mutual inductance coupling the two loops, coupling the two squids. So look up this paper. It's very well written um, and one of the basic papers in the flux qubit experiments. This is a Delft experiment. Um, very similar setup conceptually, but there are important differences. So again, two coupled flux qubits. And two flux qubits coupled by inductance. Uh, let's see. This is one of the qubits. It looks like a figure eight. The three junctions are these little specks here. The reason why it looks like figure eight is to protect it from noise. Um, if a noise uh, noise magnetic field fluctuates like that, it will couple to this side and to this side equally, and uh, the effect on these junctions will cancel because it will flow currents in the opposite directions. So that's called a gradiometer. That's a uh, standard trick in magnetometry to cancel um, uniform noise fluctuations. This experiment also has two readouts. Not one readout like the Berkeley experiment, but two readouts. So these lighter shapes, these are readout squids with two big junctions. This is the readout for the right qubit. Uh, this is the readout for the left qubit. And there are um, numerous bias lines to control individually the qubits and control them together, control the bias coupling. So this is a, a small scale two node quantum processor, if you will, with a lot of controls. And what they set out to do in this experiment is to not simply demonstrate the coupling between the two squids, but to perform a two qubit quantum gate. There are certain requirements that you have to fulfill to call whatever you do with your qubit a quantum gate. And those requirements can be formulated by typically these kind of matrices. So what is this matrix? This is a matrix that transforms the in starting state into an ending state. So you have to have your starting state here multiplied by the final state and you get the, the transformation. So it's a linear transformation. Um, why are there four columns in this matrix? That must mean there are four states, right? So who can tell me the four states? Well, they are written up here. Uh, never mind. Uh, the four states that are the basis of a two-qubit system are these states. And this already tells you that the, the two qubits are coupled. Because the state with a left qubit in 0 and the right qubit in 0 is distinct from the state with left qubit in 1 and the right qubit in 0. And um, uh, actually, that's not so surprising. This is surprising th th that these two states are different. Yeah. So this tells you that there is a basis of four states. OK. And now, so you have to line them up like this. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And here as well. And now, what does this matrix do? Well, what it does is if the control qubit, the C qubit, is in a zero state, that's this block here, nothing happens to the other qubit. So if you start with 0, 0, you go into 0, 0 after you've applied this matrix. If you start with 0, 1, you go into 0, 1. Nothing happens. Very different from this block down here. That's when the control qubit is in 1. When control qubit is in 1, the other qubit, the target qubit, acquires some phase shifts. So that is a controlled phase gate. And uh, the controlled not gate is a, a particular example of this gate. It's when, when the control qubit is in one state, the target qubit is flipped. So that matrix would look like that. 1, 1 here, all these zeros here, 0, 0, 1, 1. So 
So that is a flip of a second qubit when the first qubit is in the state 1. So this is a particular example of this matrix when uh, this argument here, omega t is equal to pi. And omega t already tells you that to perform a perfect C0 gate, you have to wait and let the qubits couple for a particular amount of time. When the, you couple the qubits, they start evolving. And if you stop that evolution at a particular time, you get a perfect C0 gate. So we're going to look at it in more details in the next slide. But first, I wanted to uh, once again impress you with the uh, complexity of these experiments um, and maybe scare you a little bit, actually, because here is not just two qubits, and uh, now we have four microwave tones, that's because we have four different transitions in this system. Um, we have uh, <coughs> a separate circuit to read out the qubit on the right, a separate circuit to read out qubits on the left. These are all microwave circuits, so they're not just resistors soldered. Uh, they are all uh, carefully designed waveguides, uh, uh, pulse generators, uh, amplifiers at low frequencies, filters, uh, amplifiers at low temperatures, I'm sorry. Um, so this is a fairly complicated setup. Um, and uh, you kids are probably wondering what this is. This is a computer. So this is how they looked in 2007. Uh, so you know, if, you, if you're going to write a paper with such a diagram, just leave out the computer. Because <laughs> in five years, people will make fun of you, I'm sure. <laughs> OK, so uh, here I added this word, scalable. Is this scalable? You know, this is just two, two qubits. We have to build all this. Three qubits, I know for a fact, in Delft, they added two more of the microwave generators here. So this was a whole stack. Each guy cost 20,000 euros. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress. Now I will explain how uh, a C0 gate works, how, uh, how to run an algorithm on two coupled qubits. Uh, well, you have to um, drive some pulses on both qubits, the left and the right. They're indicated with color, red and blue. Um, so initially, you prepare some states. Uh, you, you can start from an arbitrary state in two qubits, because uh, C0 gate has to work on an arbitrary superposition of uh, the two qubits. Um, then you apply this coupling pulse that couples uh, the left and the right qubits. Um, and at the end, you um, project on different basis states to create a density matrix. Uh, and uh, finally, you read out whether the left uh, squid switches or not, whether the right squid switches or not. There are two different curves here. Uh, and they uh, allow you to build your statistics. So you run this cycle thousands of times, maybe a million times. And uh, that's how you get your data. Every, after each cycle, you write down whether the left squid switched, whether the right squid switched. Here's a level diagram once again. There are four different quantum states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And they're all different. So every uh, transition is driven with a different microwave tone different energy spacing here. And here is uh, the, the substantive part of the, of the gate. This is how you get uh, conditional evolution. So depending on the state of the first qubit, the second qubit does something different. Very simple. First, you drive at this transition. So you drive between this state and this state. Perhaps you have initialized here. And so you can um, road, oscillate the system between these two levels. Um, after uh, pi time, it will end up here. After 2 pi, it will go back. You can stop it anywhere in between to create any superposition. But let's for a second uh, imagine that we have transferred all the population to this level. Then the second thing we do is we apply this pulse here. And that couples these two levels. So when we um, 
couple these two levels, we can transfer the population here or here or create any superposition. Now what are these levels? Well, these two guys are, what's the, what's the same about these two levels? That's right. The second qubit is the same, but the first qubit is different. Yeah? So, and between these two guys, it's the different state, right? So we have, um, the first guy is the control, and the second guy is the target. So if we have transferred all the population into the control, then we can drive the target. If we go up and back down here, and we apply this tone, it is not going to excite anything because the population here is zero, and this tone is not resonant with any other transition. So if the uh, system is here after this blue tone, uh, we cannot change the state of the target qubit. Very simple. And here is the data. Uh, once again, this is in a still continuous fashion. They have tried any, any time delay here. And first, let's look at this um, thing at the bottom. Uh, this is the readout of the control qubit, the probability of being up or down. So the probability of being here or here, equivalently. And the probability oscillates as expected. So around here, we have transferred all the population of the control qubit into the one state. So we've gone from this level all the way to this level. This is 100% populated. Now on this axis is the time for which we apply the second pulse, the red pulse. And along this axis we also have an oscillation. But uh, the oscillation is the strongest uh, around this point where the control qubit is flipped. Here we have this uh, huge oscillation. It oscillates between the target qubit being in one state and the target qubit being in the zero state. Now off the axis, here, at the minimum of this uh, sinusoidal curve, um, nothing happens. Nothing happens to the target qubit. This color is the readout of the target qubit. So that's a controlled uh, NOT gate. You just have to go here or here, that will be a perfect control NOT gate. And in between it will be some kind of a phase gate, C phase gate. Turns out any two qubit gate, um, C phase or C NOT or another gate, is sufficient to build a um, quantum computer. So there you can show that um, by adding some individual qubit rotations, you can go from one of these gates to the other. So uh, all of this is good. OK. Now we go to transmons. Remember, transmons are uh, these uh, things with big wings, capacitors, and uh, the Josephson part is uh, this little speck in the middle. That is a little loop with two Josephson junctions. A loop is to control the Josephson inductance. So this is a huge capacitor with a slight nonlinearity due to Josephson effect. And this is one of the best qubits uh, we have to date. And the neat thing about uh, these qubits uh, is that they were already early on coupled to these wonderful high uh, quality factor resonators that work in the microwave domain. By now, all types of qubits are coupled to these resonators, but these were kind of the first. Uh, where have to, do you have to put the transform relative to the resonator? Do you have to, because the re microwave forming is standing wave, do yeah. you have to put on the, the nodes? At the maximum, at the maximum. Uh, when you want to, uh, the, the largest coupling between the resonator and the, and the qubit. Okay. Yeah, otherwise, it won't couple to photons. So basically, so. there's a lot of uh, standing, uh, not just like one wave, right? Or like uh, one cycle of the microwave. Right. Okay. I mean, you, you can, it's a, it's a parameter you can play with. If you want maximum coupling, you want it at the maximum. But that is a design consideration. This, these microwave resonators are like cavities. <coughs> okay. 
so what do we have on this chip? We have uh, one resonator and we have two transmons, one and two, the red and the blue transmons. Uh, we can apply three different tones. Why three? There are two qubits. What's the third tone? I heard coupling. Coupling between the qubits. Uh, think again. What else is in the picture? Okay, how about I stand here? <laughs> yeah, so the third one is for the resonator. Um, now, and, and remember, um, however many qubits we put in this resonator, the only thing we measure here is the transmission of microwave signal. And uh, so information about this qubit, this qubit, and if we want to stick more in here, will all be contained in the phase shift of the microwave signal that comes out of this end. So we just have to do the uh, homodyne detection through a mixer and we get a, a constant DC voltage here which will just uh, be our uh, qubit readout. Also we have uh, two uh, biases for the right qubit and for the left qubit. Those are uh, gate voltages. They shift the, the charging part of the, of the transmog. Uh, no, they are, uh, sorry, they are the, the little loops, they, ch they shift the Josephson part of the transmog, because transmogs are not sensitive to, to charge. Uh, they are, they go like this, they are little loops and they couple current into the loop of the transmog. That's the zoom in, I apologize. Uh, now what the, um, the spectrum looks like, and uh, they can uh, also detect the spectrum by measuring through the resonator. Um, a spectrum has these lines. Uh, so um, this is a, primarily the transition of a, one of the qubits, and this is a transition of the other qubit. So one of them seems to be fairly constant, and the other one seems to change quite a bit. Uh, who can tell me why that is? Right, so the, the right gate is swept, so the right bias, flux bias. But nonetheless, uh, we can tune these levels on resonance. Um, we can tune the two qubit levels on resonance, and we see, again, the anti-crossing. So once again, the two qubits are coupled. How are they coupled? They're millimeters apart. There is no inductive coupling between them. Um, for that you need a big overlap, two lines running close together for the currents to couple directly. So how are they coupled? That's right. They're coupled because they are in a cavity. And so the field in the cavity couples the two qubits. That's a wonderful thing. The cavity is here. It's not on resonance with the two qubits. But it is close enough on resonance that it allows some, uh, some coupling between the two fields. And of course the qubits are also coupled to the cavity like we discussed in the last lecture. There's a big anti-crossing here between the cavity and the qubit. So by tuning uh, the right uh, bias you can uh, make the, the right qubit resonant with the left qubit or with the cavity so you could uh, do an exchange operation here and dump the qubit information into the photon or you could uh, directly couple it into the second qubit. So that's quite uh, remarkable and it's very powerful because uh, now we don't have to put the qubits together very closely. But we can put them quite some distance apart, in this case millimeters. But that's already um, opens a lot of uh, possibilities. Okay. Now I want to go a little bit through um, these boxes. What can you do with two qubits, um, two transmons that are coupled via a cavity? Uh, 
Uh, the first thing uh, on the left here is a, is a scheme that you can apply to entangle the two qubits. So we already touched upon this. Uh, entangler consists of uh, individual qubit rotations and this uh, double block. So the, the difference between these things is uh, what physical operation you do. Uh, the individual boxes are, um, you can bias individual qubits with applying their tones. Um, and this box here is you drive it to the anti-crossing and let it sit there for a while. And, and that couples the two qubits. Um, and so uh, depend, uh, you can uh, prepare initial states of the two qubits uh, in, in any uh, superposition of the qubit states. And then drive here. And then uh, do another projection. And you can prepare entangled states. <coughs> the second block here, state tomography. Tomography. This is uh, the same tomography like what you do in a hospital. Uh, this tells you what state you have prepared. So what you do here is you then rotate individual qubits to different basis states uh, around different axes and you do a joint readout that tells you which state the qubit 1 is and which state the qubit 2 is. Um, and by repeating this multiple times uh, you can keep this identical and uh, change the axis along which you project. Uh, and then repeat that thousands of times, you can get these kind of histograms. What these histograms uh, show you is that uh, it is possible with a very high fidelity to prepare entangled states like that and like that. That's because the, the bars, the coincidences, only exist between uh, states that together form entangled superpositions. And the height of these bars is, uh, you know, translates into how often uh, these situations occur. And if the bar is very low or zero, that means that does not occur. And by comparing the height of these bars with one or with whatever you expect, people can estimate the fidelity of this entangling operation. Uh, so they routinely achieve very high fidelities here. And um, this is a good news for quantum computing because we need entanglement in our circuits to run uh, universal quantum computing algorithms. This one here, uh, you can see this is actually, well, a little bit more complicated, but not, not that much. Uh, a few more single qubit rotations and a couple of entanglers here couple of uh, two qubit gates. But uh, this little uh, sequence is the elementary quantum algorithm that you might want to run on a, on a quantum computer once you have it. You can already do it with two qubits. Of course, it is extremely useless with two qubits. But it is a beautiful demonstration of how things work. And it's much easier to understand with two qubits. So it's called Grover's algorithm. And uh, this algorithm uh, might find in the future applications for sorting the databases, finding the answer faster than a classical algorithm. The speed up here is not so impressive. So uh, the most optimal algorithm for searching a database with a classical computer is uh, linear in the size of the database. That means uh, your best uh, uh, way to search is to just go line by line until you find what you're looking for. That's what linear means. And this one is a uh, square root. So uh, quantum mechanics entanglement offers a, a small, f small speed up here. But it can make a difference if the database is very large. For that, of course, you need a lot of qubits. So this is still in the, in the distant future. Uh, but um, this is how this thing runs. This is your initial state, 0, 0. And, uh, they do these tomography plots uh, after performing each stage. So this is at stage B here, initialized. Then they do two rotations to prepare maximum, uh, maximum superposition state. All the bars are the same height. So this is a sort of everything is in the superposition of everything state. Here they kind of hide in these states the state that you want to later find. So this is called an oracle. And the, the way they hide the state is they flip the phases 
of some of these bars. So th these bars became opposite phase. So they're pointing down below the gray plane. And the state that we want to find is that the overlap of the two bars. It's this guy. So of the four states, we, we have hidden the answer in this guy. So for your database, your input would be the phases on different uh, states, and then you can, you can f find the answer. So after this, you project onto an entangled state. Uh, you rotate uh, the first qubit, you rotate the second qubit, and uh, voila, by magic, you've inverted the phases and you collapsed all your uh, population onto the state that you, that you hid earlier. And so Grover's algorithm found the answer with a very high fidelity. Almost no error anywhere else. Um, I leave you, if you're curious, just go through the paper and understand all the steps a little bit better. I want to get to other qubits in this lecture. Uh, but um, you know, if you want to understand quantum algorithms, this is as easy as they get. And this is a beautiful paper uh, that describes these data. I already told you, you can put more transmons in this resonator and uh, scale it up. Uh, <coughs> here at the ETH, they have put three resonators in a circuit. Uh, three qubits in a resonator, sorry. A, B, and C. Um, circuit becomes more complicated. Uh, there are more controls. Here are qubits. Uh, a, B, and C. They have their own biases. There is for now just one resonator coupling them though. So this is a wonderful, flexible, scalable architecture. Uh, hook up these resonators, let them uh, run through your chip, and uh, attach qubits to them. What they could do with uh, three qubits is uh, something analogous to what I explained to you, entangled states, but now entangled states of three qubits. And maximum entangled states of three qubits look something like this, 0, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, 1. Those are uh, often called GHZ states for the three guys who um, came up with these states. Not the gigahertz states. And uh, what you have to do to prepare this is um, pairwise couplings of the qubits. So you don't, you don't make them all resonant together and go to that point and entangle everything, though I guess theoretically you could. Uh, but you uh, work with transmons, which are already qubits that are extremely coherent, and they allow you to do several entangling operations in a sequence. So you start by preparing an arbitrary superposition in each of the qubits. Then you entangle B and C. Then you entangle A and B. Then you project and read out, do the tomography. And at the end, after thousands and thousands of cycles, you can make this density matrix. And you can see there is a little trace of non-perfect non uh, behavior in this, uh, in this plot. But um, the highest bars at the ends correspond to 0, 0, 1, 1 correlations. And um, another thing you see is that the number of things you have to measure increased. So the previous density matrix was um, 16. And this one is uh, maybe 64, something like that. Uh, so uh, you know, with four qubits, uh, at some point, I think people I think people have done four qubits, and uh, then it was uh, really a, a huge plot with, uh, with uh, a bunch of matrix elements that you have to all measure. And uh, after that, they say, OK, you know, it's every is different frequency. I mean, um, we, could, we could keep going, but uh, all right. Um, and this kind of uh, also, uh, this is very fundamental to quantum computing, because actually, you're not going to do this density matrix uh, every time you run your quantum algorithms. Because to obtain all this data will take a very long time. Uh, and uh, the beauty of quantum speed up 
is uh, saving time. And so at some point, our quantum circuit will be working so well that we will have to trust it and not decompose every gate that we do into this tomography. So three qubits, four qubits, um, I don't know, 10 qubits is maybe humanly possible to map out all these states and prove that 10 qubits are entangled. After a certain limit, 100 qubits, we will have to just trust the system that it's entangled. And uh, that requires individual qubit fidelities at a very, very high level to trust in entanglement. So they have pushed it to four qubits. And this circuit is uh, a wonderful circuit uh, in which they want to do something uh, borrowed from quantum optics, uh, essentially. And that's because uh, <coughs> here the four qubits are in the corners. And in this case, there are three resonators. Resonator 1, resonator 2, resonator 3. And these corner qubits, they are an interesting shape like that. So they're coupled to two resonators at the same time. So b by uh, means of such geometries, you can create uh, beam splitters, like in optics, uh, quantum beam splitters. Um, and from, from the quantum computing architecture, uh, you can couple multiple qubits uh, with different buses. Uh, if you can couple one qubit to two, three, or four resonators, you can really think of scaling this up to a, to a whole wafer. So the circuit looks like this. I just draw your attention to, for example, this one node. This is a qubit. Uh, this is one resonator. This is another resonator. And uh, both of these resonators are capacitively coupled to this qubit. Now, similar experiments were done at uh, Santa Barbara with uh, phase qubits, where they also played various games. They started with a quantum state in this qubit, then they transferred it into this resonator, then into this resonator, and then took another one, put it here. So uh, you can implement an infinite number of uh, sequences if your qubits are good enough. Resonators can also act as memories, because uh, they might be longer living than the, your qubits. It all depends on your technology. OK. Now we're going to shift gears, because um, people in the semiconductor quantum dot business were also trying to scale up qubits. And they achieved a um, pretty high level of success, though superconducting qubits, I would say, are a little bit ahead. But it is wonderful to uh, review these experiments, because they exploit different kinds of physics, those beautiful physics here as well. And as a reminder, I want to show you um, what the system looks like uh, once again. Uh, it is a heterostructure in a semiconductor. That's what we studied in the first half of the course. Uh, a two-dimensional electron gas is formed at the interface here between gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide. And on top of the structure, there are gates. There are electrodes that apply electric fields here. And with these electric fields, we can create, uh, most importantly, the double dot uh, quantum systems, double potential wells. We can find two electrons in each dot. And then we build qubits out of spins of these electrons. We could do it with charge. But because of the charge noise, those qubits are not very long lived. So in a double dot structure, we often uh, find these kind of charging diagrams where in between the lines in these islands of red, a charge on both dots is fixed by Coulomb blockade. Right? And uh, the most interesting region is here with 1 and 1, means each dot has one electrode. This is an, a completely empty double dot system, so we have to add one electron to the uh, left dot and add one electron to the right dot. And we go here, and we do it all by gates. Yeah, this is an AFM picture of a device from the top. Well, for completion, I show you an, uh, an example of data from a nanowire once again. Uh, you don't have to do it with two decks, also with wires. 
And uh, <coughs> when you control individual spins trapped in these quantum dots, uh, you can induce transitions between spin up and spin down by going on resonance with the microwave excitation. And you can observe Rabi oscillations of single spins. That's universal control over individual spins trapped in quantum dots. In this case, we rely on spin blockade to read it out. So a triplet state is trapped in this double dot system, and a singlet state can uh, go into the two dot regime. Two electrons on a dot regime. So how do we do a two spin coupling gate? It, we stay still in a double dot system, and it turns out in this case we take advantage of the exchange interaction between the two spins, between the two electrons. So they are extremely close in this case. You know, transmons were millimeters apart, and these guys are 20 nanometers apart. Very close. And so their wave functions overlap. There's exchange coupling between the two electrons. So th we're going to use that as a gate to couple two individual qubits. If you remember these uh, level diagrams that have, uh, for the two dot system, the singlet state, the three triplet states, and this is the singlet O2 state uh, where both electrons are on the same dot. But around here, if we zoom in, we have uh, uh, these two, two electron states, and they are coupled by exchange interaction. So once again, there are states that correspond to um, nominally uncoupled electrons, and then exchange interaction introduces some coupling, and that's a splitting between the states. So the way we control uh, this gate is if we move here, uh, the states are decoupled, and we move back here, and they're coupled. And that's we do with gates. So we make the two levels in the quantum dot on resonance, and we maximize exchange coupling. And what that does is uh, you can start with up and down and uh, bring the two qubits coupled, and you can start with down and up. You can build a two qubit gate out of that. This is called a swap operation, and turns out that the square root swap is equivalent to a C naught gate if you add some um, single qubit rotation. So this kind of operation will complete our system to a scalable quantum computer. And this is the experiment by uh, Jason Petta and co-workers at Harvard uh, from 2005, a first, actually, historically, uh, use of spins as qubits in semiconductor quantum dots. Uh, already gave us a two qubit gate from the standpoint of uh, single spins. Uh, what he has done is he has uh, tuned uh, the two electrons on resonance with a high exchange coupling. And he let them sit there for a variable time, and he has observed oscillations between the uh, singlet state of the electrons and the triplet state. So if you go exactly uh, here, that would be square root swap, and that would be the universal quantum gate of two single spins. So you can do it very fast in a few hundred picoseconds. So once again, this is how they do it. Um, they just uh, apply these kind of pulses to the gates um, and uh, to initialize in a singlet state and then let it evolve. And depending on this time, it will end up in a singlet state or a triplet state. And uh, finally, they read out with a charge sensor. Uh, those are the um, tools you have in spin qubits. Uh, the, the level diagram is once again here. You have a singlet and a triplet. And uh, this is the exchange coupling. So this is where the original data from Jason Petta. Uh, you can do it um, for a little bit longer time, actually. Uh, this is the newer data from uh, Harvard. Um, and if you add a little echo here to reverse the evolution of the system, you can keep observing these oscillations. Uh, these are just uh, 30 nanosecond traces uh, that follow each other, stacked on top of each other. So at the end here, we still see something oscillating after five microseconds. So you, you can do a lot of these two qubit gates 
uh, before the system decoheres. And uh, what allows you to do that is this spin echo. Now, this spin echo is very interesting from the point of view of uh, individual spins because this is a rephasing operation, uh, uh, operation that recovers coherence uh, from the standpoint of a two qubit gate. So this acts specifically on the decoherence uh, of the two qubit operation. Before I showed you uh, echo from the standpoint of a single qubit, so the spin sees some fluctuating magnetic fields, but if they fluctuate slow enough, by reversing the evolution of the spin halfway through the cycle, you can refocus uh, the quantum state. And now with two spins, you can do the same. So by playing some tricks from borrowed from NMR, you can uh, do a very good on uh, two qubit gates with spins. People have also approached uh, the measurements of uh, entanglement in this system. Um, this is a device uh, that they used is exactly the same. They have uh, two uh, detectors on the left and on the right. Um, the double dot system, now they applied a very large magnetic field and uh, the energy difference between spin up and spin down enabled them to do single shot readout of the left spin and on the right spin. So the single shot readout works like that. If you bias the levels halfway between the Fermi level and the lead, uh, the excited state can escape, but the ground state cannot. So if you see a little blip on the charge sensor, that tells you that the spin has escaped. And they have um, performed a readout of several different kinds. Uh, in this situation, both detectors did not flip. That means both spins were in the ground state. Here, the left spin was in the excited state. Uh, the right spin was in the ground state. And so they've mapped out the same four states that we already recognize from flux qubits, from transmons, the four states, the four possibilities with a two qubit system. And then what they have done is, uh, before doing this readout, they have uh, brought the two guys together and let them exchange couple and evolve. And they have obtained uh, these exchange oscillations and they were able to create these uh, density matrices which correspond to the, the swap gate performed on the two qubits. So they achieved uh, not such a high fidelity as in uh, superconducting qubits experiment, but they demonstrate uh, in principle this flipping. However, important nuance, they did not actually observe entanglement because uh, in between when they uh, read out, uh, the system decohered. So uh, you can obtain these kind of beautiful bars, but doesn't mean you have entanglement. So this is a very tricky business, these bars to be taken very carefully. Okay, so I think that's summarized here. Um, now, um, a little bit hard to see, but um, this is a very beautiful uh, experiment, uh, still staying with single electron qubits. Uh, in quantum dots. Uh, this was just uh, published in March on the archive, so very fresh. A very peculiar physical phenomenon. Uh, here we have a three dot system. There is one dot here, one dot here, and one dot here. And this is a readout for all of these guys. Uh, so what this experiment shows is that they can load an electron here and without ever being in the middle dot they can make it appear over here. It's kind of a magic trick. Uh, this paper does not have anything to do with spin, per se. This is just transfer of charge from the left side to the right side. Um, this is a kind of a processes that they um, uh, observe. Um, they have a charge stability diagram of a three quantum dots, so uh, there are three different charge numbers to describe these states. This is a completely empty triple dot, no electrons anywhere. 
Here they can load one electron into the middle dot. Here they can load one electron into the left dot. And here they can load one electron into the right dot. Uh, here they can add electron into each dot. And now the interesting region is between this and this. So what happens here is the population of the middle dot remains the same and the electron seems to be transferred from the right dot to the left dot. We go this way. Now what they do is they apply uh, different uh, microwave frequencies here, photons. They apply photons. And what they see is Maybe you can see very faintly, but I encourage you to go and look on the archive. Uh, they see uh, the different lines correspond to photon-assisted tunneling. So transitions between the dots uh, mediated by a photon. So you get the energy from a photon and you can go over. So that gives you signals. And the slopes of these signals are these lines that you can probably see. The left and the right and the C. So what's remarkable is that uh, from the slope of this line, you can tell which two dots are coupled. Because uh, uh, what you shift here is the two, uh, two gates. So in the space of two gates, each of these transitions corresponds to uh, mutual capacitance between, to a certain object between these gates. So they have identified that this slope, slope corresponds to tuning the right dot. This slope corresponds to tuning the left dot. And this slope corresponds to tuning the central dot. And um, the only way for this to occur is uh, if you go directly from here to here. So the three relevant processes are shown here. Um, around this uh, point, uh, you would be exciting from this chemical potential on the left into the middle. You would be doing this transfer. On the, down here on the right, it's this situation, mirror to that, but from the right. And now in the middle, these two energy levels are way out. And so there is nothing available in the middle dot for this microwave signal. So you go from here to here. This is kind of a conclusion. There is more data in this paper uh, to uh, confirm this uh, conclusion. There is another paper from Canada a couple months before this one. But what is the significance of this? Well, the significance is, what if you scale this to four dots, five dots, a hundred dots? That means you can non-locally couple this dot to this dot using just uh, wave function overlap via this coherent transfer of charge from one dot to the other. So maybe this is a pathway to some kind of a qubit architecture where chains of quantum dots allow you to implement long distance coupling. So maybe an alternative to superconducting resonators. So the final topic uh, today is um, I'm going to do another flip on you. And uh, sticking with the same system, I will now call this a single qubit. I have already done this uh, before when we discussed spin qubits, uh, but now uh, this is actually a better spin qubit uh, de facto, longer coherence times observed for this situation than for single qubits, and uh, this is the first one historically proposed. So the situation is that a single qubit is encoded in two electrons, and the basis of that qubit is the same singlet triplet states that I previously called uh, uh, states necessary for a swap operation on two single spin qubits. Now these become the basis states of a single tri singlet triplet qubit. So we ignore, we don't have access to the individual evolution of the two spins. We only have access to these two states. So we cannot apply microwaves to flip this spin or flip this spin. We can only do exchange to induce transition from here to here and back. That's our basis, and that's the only thing we can do. Now, what would a two single triplet qubit gate look like? You have to build something like this 
one qubit is two electrons, so couple two qubits, you have to build two dots, two double dots, a system of four electrons. Pretty crazy, and uh, all these gates and control the four dots, you know, to tune each dot takes some time, tune four dots takes a little bit more time, but it's worth it because uh, there's already experimental progress and there are ideas how to scale it up even further. Okay, so this uh, two qubit system employs yet another principle for coupling the two qubits. This one is capacitive coupling between the two. But let's first look at the basis states. The basis states again four, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, just like uh, throughout the lecture with flux qubits or single spin qubits or transmon qubits. The nature of the states is, however, remember 0 would be then something like a singlet and 1 would be a triplet. So these are uh, singlet, singlet, triplet, singlet, uh, singlet, triplet, triplet, triplet. And note that the dots, the little electron positions, are somewhat different between a singlet and a triplet. Uh, that is what is behind the coupling of the two qubits. So we previously ignored this, but uh, there is actually a difference in capacitance and charge distribution inside the quantum dot, depending on whether you have a singlet or a triplet. For a triplet, the two electrons don't like to be near each other due to Pauli principle. So they're as far apart as they can. And for a singlet, they're maybe a little bit closer. So that slight difference would give us the ability to distinguish all these states and to um, induce a C naught gate. So <coughs> the coupling, uh, this, these are uh, diagrams for individual qubit, and uh, the C phase gate would work uh, like this. Uh, the coupling strength would depend on what, what is the exchange in the left qubit and in the right qubit uh, and the capacitive coupling energy between the two. So the first thing that people have done is uh, just map out the charge states in a four quantum dot system. Here is dot one, two, three, four. It's a different sample. This is from a different group in Cambridge. Um, and uh, they have a gate L2 and they have a gate L1. So here they sweep gate L1 versus L2. And the color is the color on a charge sensor on one of the dots. Significant thing here is this kink, of course. This kink shows that the charge state changes as a function of both L1 and L2. So if the two dots were not coupled, this would just be a straight line. And uh, so this is a transition in the dot 1. And uh, so it would only be sensitive to gate L1, and nothing will happen as a function of gate L2. Now, if this gate L2 here directly coupled to this dot, if that were the dominant source, we would expect to see a slope here, continuous slope. Probably there is a slope. They just subtracted it out. They have, uh, and what they want you to focus on is this kink. This kink is when you add uh, another electron on the dot or shift the two electrons to the same dot, change the charge state of this dot, and that affects the other dot. So a change of just one electron in this dot shifts the charge levels in the other dot. So that shows you that on a level of single electrons, this double dot and this double dot are coupled. And that's what we need for qubits. They have then mapped out uh, the spectroscopy of the same states, one, two, three, four, the same quantum states of two coupled qubits, and they have found some anti-crossings, so the states are coupled. Just like in the other systems. This you already recognize. Now people have approached it in steps and the progress was made uh, a little bit incremental. Uh, this is an experiment from Harvard again where 
again, slightly different design, the target qubit and the control qubit. So they were going to go for the C0 gate with the target and the control. So as a function of the state of the target, of control, they wanted to affect the state of the target. The th first thing they have observed is that depending on the state of the control, they could slow down or accelerate the evolution of the target. That's all. So these are Rabi oscillations of the target qubit. And the two curves correspond to both electrons being on the same dot in the control and both electrons being on opposite dots in the control. So what they do here is they shift one electron over and they go from the blue trace to the red trace. And so they slow down the evolution of the qubit. That's because shifting a charge around affects capacitively the coupling between the two dots in the target. And it changes the exchange interaction in that qubit and makes the qubit go slower. So probably reduces the exchange interaction. Okay, because the exchange interaction depends on the how strongly coupled are the two electrons. So that changes with the charge and the control. So about here, around this region or around this region, they observe a complete reversal uh, of the state of the other qubit. So if you just wait for 20 nanoseconds, uh, if the two electrons are on opposite dots, uh, you'll be a minimum. If they are on the same dot, you'll be in a maximum. So this is kind of a, would be the time for your C0 C gate if, if all the coherences and all the uh, necessary ingredients were here. However, in this experiment, uh, they did not achieve the right level of coherence to claim entanglement at this point. Uh, but later, with some improvements, when they understood how to properly do echoes on individual qubits and on the joint operation and uh, how to take charge of the, how to control the nuclear spins and various dephasing mechanisms in the group of Amir Yacobi uh, at Harvard, they were able to achieve and demonstrate entanglement in a four quantum dot, two qubit uh, system. They were able to produce the same diagrams that you recognize not plotted uh, linearly, but uh, from the switching events of the left and of the right qubit, you can then create the correlations uh, between the left and the right and uh, obtain these kind of density matrices for the two qubit um, evolution. And uh, for the proper pulse sequences and the proper coupling sequences, just like for superconducting qubits, uh, they were able to demonstrate entangled states. Um, so this is their data and this is their theory, I believe. Um, oh no, this is just uh, subtracting some dephasing. Uh, yeah, so um, this was a wonderful experiment uh, published, I think, last year from Amir Kobe's group. Now, they have also, they were able to um, vary the coupling between the two qubits. And so by, by changing the detuning in these quantum dots, again, by changing gates, they were able to accelerate this evolution of the, in the four dot system or slow it down. Um, they did not, were not able to obtain more operations. Uh, basically, what this shows is, uh, when you are above this line, you are entangled, and then you let it evolve further, and the, the two qubits flip back, and they disentangle. And ideally, you want this to go on and on and on, like in flux qubits, for example, or in transmons. But uh, after one cycle, it all doesn't come back anymore above this line. So um, for all these curves. So you can make it faster, but you cannot make several operations. The reason for that, so here are the times. Uh, you can, uh, these are the times. You can make it go faster and approach about 100 nanoseconds. The reason why you cannot really improve the, qu the quality is in part because the capacitive coupling between the four dots is pretty small. Um, that's the limiting factor. And that sets this rate pretty much. So you can calculate 
what capacitance you get between the, uh, however you want to arrange them, the four electrons like that or like that. And remember, the difference that you have is them being like that and like that in the best case, but actually triplet and singlet are only varied by slight uh, changes in charge. So uh, a small change in charge multiplied by a small change in a small capacitance that you have um, limits you in this case. But they have uh, thought of this problem and they came up with a solution that I'm sure they're trying right now. Uh, this is already published. Um, they came up with a way to enhance this coupling by adding an extra metal which is floating between the two dots. So the blue line is not connected to any other metal. And this is called a floating gate. So what will happen is this charge will couple into this gate and then from this gate couple into this dot. So this is a floating coupling gate. And they have done some calculations that showed them that here is where they were with directly coupling through the semiconductor and here is where they hope to be with a, with a metallic coupler. So a much larger strength. They also came up with different designs for this coupler. And it can also uh, theoretically allow them to separate the two uh, double dots by a large distance on the chip. So once again, we come up to the same uh, idea. How do we couple multiple qubits? How do we couple them far apart on the chip? So one solution is uh, microwave resonators. Uh, the other solution was uh, some kind of magic coherent transfer where you skip one dot and you go to the next dot. And can you extend it to 10 dots, 100 dots? Probably tricky. This, uh, this seems quite viable. Um, metallic couplers that enhance the range of your capacitive coupling. This would be a way to go for these wonderful qubits. And remember from uh, uh, five lectures ago, these qubits are quite coherent. A single qubit operation in 100 picoseconds and coherence times of 100 microseconds. Yeah. So if we can enhance the qubit to qubit coupling, this could be a very strong architecture for quantum computing. So thank you very much.